Uh, welcome everybody to our next design cast here on the Game Wisdom channel. I am Josh Placer, and we have another fascinating discussion about the art and design of games. This week we are doing something a little bit differently. We're going to be talking about the role of games in the classroom, as well as kind of teaching design. Because this is something that for my audience, I don't know if they're too familiar with it. And joining me is a contact of mine. He is a teacher who has been using video games in the classroom, as well as teaching about design all around. So please welcome to our cast, Steve Isaac. Hi, thanks, Josh. It's great to have you on. How are you doing today? I am doing great. How are you doing? I am busy as uh, I'm ever, so I'm sure you're the same way. Absolutely. <laughs> So, it is great to have you on. We've been talking on Twitter back and forth for a while now, and it's great to finally have this kind of sit-down chat. So, uh, I guess to begin with, before we get to some of our meteor questions, since this is your first time on the cast, could you talk a little bit about your background, and also kind of like, what, I guess, do you use video games in your classroom for? Sure. Uh, so, I, I teach, I currently teach game design and development, uh, that's exclusively what I teach. I teach at a middle and high school in Basking Ridge, New Jersey, and I've been, you know, using games in the classroom essentially my whole career. In fact, I started um, as a special education teacher. Uh, I had a, a, a self-contained class uh, at a school that happened to be a science and technology magnet school, and because of that, we had access to a lot of technology, so quickly I kind of started to see the power that games had, especially with my students in terms of individualizing the learning mm -hmm. experience. So that was especially um, eye-opening, you know, back then. And then uh, my wife and I and another couple opened a computer training and gaming center, uh, which essentially offered after-school classes and summer camps. Summer was our biggest season. And in time, we also realized the power of multiplayer gaming and started opening in the evenings as an, as like a game center, a land center. And this was like 20 years ago. Um, so there we also used games quite a bit in our programming, mainly because it really uh, brought a high level of interest to kids. It was relevant to them. And we also tied in great learning outcomes so that, <laughs> that you know, sort of got parent buy-in. And since it was a private, you know, uh, enterprise, you know, it was a matter of people either signed up for our camps and classes or they didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, we got into game design there as well. And then, you know, fast forward a little bit, I then got hired at the school where I am now about 20 something years ago uh, to basically then to bring some of the innovative mm -hmm. stuff we were doing at our game, at our center to the public school. Um, and then I started an after school game design club and then offered a unit in our gifted and talented program for game design and eventually asked my supervisor and principal if I could start a full game design program and luckily got their blessing and started and it became you know hugely popular and you know ended up taking you know my whole schedule where it used to be that I would teach several electives now game design fills up all my elective periods and we just brought it to high to the high school this year um, so that gives you a little bit background on the game design part. Um, as far as games, for me, you know, um, so much learning happens in games. Uh, in fact, we're constantly learning in games. So I've always been intrigued by that. Uh, but in my case, since I teach game design, one of the most important things for my kids is to play a lot of games to get a sense of what, you know, what's important, what game mechanics you know, are you know are are in play in a game. You know, ramp of difficulty. What makes a game good? What makes a game bad? All of those things. So they kind of get into deeply analyzing games to prepare for ultimately creating their own games, which is what the real focus of my. Great. I I think uh, the two of us are going to be really good friends, and because you just described a lot of the stuff that I like to do, and like for like. I'm sure, like, as you tweet to your audience, like, for your people coming who are not sure about me, I've been talking about game design and trying to educate people about it since about 2012. And, of course, I do my videos, I have two books out, and I also do presentations at schools and libraries about 
trying again to educate people about what game design is and why it is a very fascinating topic to study, not just at the school level, but even you know, beyond it. You know, like I said, a lot of my audience are people who already graduate and they're trying to build their first game and understand that there's a lot that goes into this. Huh, yeah, yeah. That's uh, something my students, uh, it's funny because one of the things they have to do throughout the process is reflect on their experience and write, you know, sort of a narrative about, you know, um, their successes, their challenges, and they always come back with the fact that they find that um, it's a lot harder than they thought and a lot more involved. So, I, I can tell you right now that a few of my regulars who are developers are probably feeling the very same way as your students with that. Yeah, I bet, I bet. So uh, a lot of reward, though. Mm -hmm. So uh, so I just want to clarify: when you first started your uh, game design camp, was that in like two thousand? Was that twenty years ago? Yeah, it was. Whew. It was yeah, it was at least we used. I mean, gosh, Game Maker was a very early version, um, and that was what we started using way back then, and a few other tools. But uh, yeah, it was at least. 20 years ago, I mean, it's been at least 10 years that I've had, um, you know, a full semester elective at the middle school, um, you know, so yeah, it's been a long time. Cool. And also, just as a quick aside, I think I'm hearing your Discord notifications when they're coming in. I know, in. how do I turn that silly thing off? Because, there should uh, be, if you click on your profile, your little icon, you can set it to do not disturb, and that should yeah. turn them off. Of all things, Discord is, uh, I use it all the time because of, like, <laughs> the sports community, but I just don't quite, let's see. So you're saying go to... If you go to mm. your little, like, your actual, like, profile, your icon, where it has, yep. like, the gr little green light, you can set that to do not disturb. Yeah. Yeah. I've had to get good with Discord with all the stuff that I've been doing, so... I know, I know. Me too, oh. but, the <laughs> but it can't... Let's see. Um, mm -hmm. Always the fun of. Uh, yeah. You know where it is? I'm, I'm really looking for it. I'm in, maybe in the wrong place. I'm in my little gear thing. Maybe that's a bit. Maybe. Um, it should be actually just on your little icon. Let's see. Discord is. Oh, if you, I see it. Yeah. See. That's going to stay on now forever. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> See, folks, I'm educating even with the uh, Discord. It never stop. <laughs> funny because all like it's it, well. The funny thing is, through my class, kids always hear the notification. <laughs> so I think it gives me a little street cred because <laughs> my uh, Discord notifications are going off. But <laughs> now I know how to sign. Thank you. No problem. But uh, back on top of it, like 20 years ago, that is definitely fascinating. Because like like around here, I'm in South Jersey, like. Around that time, I was still in high school, and like we had like nothing video game related at all, and we did a actual podcast about games in the classroom. This was I think 2014, 2015 with some designers, and uh -huh. I'm going to be pulling some of the questions I had for them for this one because I kind of want to see how things have grown. Because, okay. uh, like I said, like in terms of like my background, my audience's background, like. We didn't really have like video games in the classroom, or like, at least not in the public sector. I know at least, and please correct me if I'm wrong. Like there were schools offering like video game related programs, or kind of I'm not sure what would be considered gamification, or just like using games to teach, like in like the mid thousands, at least in the private sector or private schools. Uh, say that again. I'm sorry. That were there schools like private schools having like video game related courses or video game teaching in the mid or early thousands? Yeah, there might have been a little bit. I, it's funny because whenever I tell people that I teach game design in a middle school or high school, their first question is, "Oh, you must be at a private school or an independent yeah. school That's where they kind of you know do that kind of thing." But um, but yeah, mine happens to be public. But yeah, which is so interesting because um, I you know I mean. I guess there maybe has been some. I, I'll tell you, over the years, um, I've talked to a lot of people, had a lot of people visit my classroom, and I believe it's it's led to a lot of new programs because there is great interest, and I think people are starting to understand the incredible value, especially with how relevant games are to kids, but also the game industry. You know, it's like we're you know, school should be about preparing kids for some sort of future, right? And mm -hmm. 
you know the the game design industry has many 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 jobs that oh, these yes. kids can now go into when you and I were younger hmm. the thought of being a video game designer felt kind of like like the dream of playing basketball in the NBA or something yeah. right now it's a lot more you know viable Oh, yeah. I mean, like, when I was growing up, I think for, like, any kid looking at Nintendo, they probably equated to, you know, getting, like, Willy Wonka, you know, Chocolate Factory, getting to run right. that. And right, right, totally. It is a lot of challenge. Again, like, my regulars are probably nodding their heads in agreement about this. And I guess, like, this is a question that I've been curious about. Like, again, like, I don't have a background in education. I haven't been to two... I've been to, like, my one of my high schools around here last year. I'm trying to do more in the high school sector. But, mm -hmm. I guess, how much has things changed in terms of, you know, this adopting or adoption of video games, you know, yeah. in schools? That's a great question. So, um, I've been involved in game-based learning since a time where people looked at you funny when you talked about using games in the classroom. Yeah. Now, it's um, a lot more mainstream thanks to games like Minecraft that are being used in very mm -hmm. creative ways by both teachers and students. Um, and because it's a sandbox game, it's often seen now more as a tool than necessarily a game. Um, recently, we started using Fortnite Creative pretty extensively. And, and similarly, because of the opportunity for kids to create in these environments, it, 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 moves up, it moved the needle where it's not just about, let's say, playing a game like Civilization to learn about yeah. ancient history, but now it's about using it as a tool to create. So I think it's a lot broader how it can be used, and that's been, um, I think that's been tremendously helpful for, for getting games into the classroom. Um, you know, so that's a big part, I'd say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember, like, when I was working at GameStop, it was, like, 10, 12 years ago, like, a teacher came in, she was looking for games that she could use in the classroom, like, to try and teach history, and okay. obviously, I mentioned civilization there, and, and I think that's a really good point about one of the big things we've seen more games do these days is have kind of, like, made it easier for people to build and create in those spaces. Yep. Mario Maker is another really yep. good example. I'm teaching, I'm going to be using that at a library presentation in a few months. Oh, cool. And yeah, yeah Go ahead. No, no, I was going to say, yeah, and I, I have that as well. You know, again, since I teach game design, it's mm -hmm. perfect. Really lends to that, but I'm sure you could find other great uses for it. Um, but I agree with you 100%. I think the, when you know, in other words, when we can go outside of, like, I, I'm a firm believer in what we can learn from games and what can be embedded in games for learning, like a game like Civilization or other content-specific games. Um, you know, you even go back to, it wasn't, I mean, when I was in school, my favorite experiences included doing um, a stock market simulation in one of my economics classes where we got a portfolio. I think back then we did it all by hand, but it was very much a game about, you know, investing and all that. We also did like a, a paper and paper and pencil type um, you know, civics or, you know, history type game that, you know, dealt with negotiation and domination and all and that was really exciting. Um so so really some people have been using games forever. Um I just I, you know, I think really, I think in in one way or other, games have always been a part of learning. It's just, you know, it, the way we talk about it mm -hmm. more now, I think, as an idea rather than just a, back then maybe it was more like, ooh, I think I could really teach this concept well with a game, which is exactly why you should. Um, but I think it's, some, you know, that's uh, becoming more mainstream, I guess the best way to say it. Yeah, and like I, in one of my presentations, I talk about like kind of being able to teach game design or the respect of it, and I say that it is a very slow process. Like a lot of people still don't really understand, I think, what goes into it. And one of the things I bring up is, can we actually teach game design? Can it be you know as formal of a study as you know the art or the pro or the coding side of things? Yeah, and the way that I approach that is all about the 
process and the iterative design process. So when it comes down to it, um, you know, like I said, first we analyze and, and evaluate games and talk about them and, and write reviews and all that. So we're kind of getting that part. Um, then when kids start creating games, the thing that I focus on is that iterative design process. They first design a game by writing a design document like any designer would. Mm-hmm. Might be a scaled back version of a design document for sure. Then they um, begin the development process. We go through a lot of rounds of, of testing and peer feedback. And then I have the kids reflect on the process. What it comes down to though is that I let them pick whatever tool they might want to use. So some of them are then going above and beyond and they're learning the tool often on their own because that's not the part that I'm focusing on teaching per se, but I want them to go through the, the design process. Um, so that part we're teaching, they're learning and, and have opportunities to figure out what area within game design they might be interested in as well. Yeah. So yeah. my kids, um, some become interested in graphic design and animation and all of a sudden they realize, wow, I didn't even know I was good at this and I love it. Some get into audio engineering, some get into level design, some do get into the coding part, but my course, I don't even bill it at all as a computer science course because I don't want to mm-hmm. have kids think that there's not a, a you know, a, a role for them that they could, you know, so, so team design teams is a huge thing to get into. So yes, I think we can teach that process um, and that's the most important part. And a question in chat from one of my contacts, Shark, he wanted mm-hmm. to ask you, um, are you aware of how harsh the game industry is at the moment, and that's getting harsher every day, and as well as are you teaching your kids that this can be harsh and that they need to be prepared? This is a, what a great question. Um, we address that in a, in a variety of ways. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll step towards uh, something we're doing where esports is getting very big right now. And esports is one area where that's a huge concern because yep. of the toxicity in the in the game industry. Now, in that regard, we face it directly and we talk about it. Um, one of the nice things is that I think we can help kids. And this is a huge point for me that I'll make. You know, um, you know, definitely talk about till I'm blue in the face. But I think we need to be addressing these issues with kids and helping them navigate these spaces. Um, I think the fault that we've had as educators, as, as educational institutions, is that we often, what we do is we don't want to address these issues in school because we're afraid of something bad happening in school. So instead, we avoid it, and then these kids are going home, and they're, you know, um, experiencing this at home in less supervised or unsupervised environments. So there's that. That's more about the the behavior of people who play games often. I also think that in that regard, because we're setting up school leagues and school organizations and things, mm-hmm. that we can have a code of conduct, we can have um, rules, we kids know they start to learn consequences for toxic behavior and stuff in a league setting and maybe we can actually change that that culture. Mm-hmm. Um, then you talk about some of the real other important issues where, and this is a really good one, Shark. Um, so we, so the game industry has its challenges in terms of misogyny and, and all of those things um, all around. You know, some of it's a matter of just the culture in a game, uh, you know, in a game uh, house you know, in, in a studio. Um, and one of the challenges I have there is is that I want very much to encourage, you know, female participation in game design. I've found uh, a number of the girls I've had in class do just a phenomenal job. And, and I think we're missing a, a lot of opportunity in that, there, in that it is a male-dominated industry. And um, I've seen girls that have come into it not even sure they were interested, you know, find that they excel. Um, But then I do have a fear. I have a fear of them then going into the industry and then experiencing that negativity, right? Hmm. So the question is, do do we 
try to support and encourage girls to get into the industry and 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 hope that we can again change that culture maybe even the playing field a bit and all those things um and it's not just male female it's you know non-gender specific and everything i think we have to to address all forms of inclusivity that are not being necessarily treated well in that environment um but i so that's you know i would like to think that we can hopefully change that i think some of the game companies have come under a lot of heat and have had to make dramatic changes in the way their companies run and some you know successfully some not so successfully so these are the tough questions for sure um no doubt about it and I think he was also interested in things from like kind of the development or the business side as well. Oh, I'm sorry. That's a great question too. Two really uh, good ones there. Yeah. So, so I, I hope it was worth. I mean, I imagine anybody listening would see value in in the, the way I thought I was answering it. Um, <laughs> but yes, the, the the thing about that um, in my class is, and I think that's where the kids' reflections, like what they do, is every week or two that they're writing, they're designing their game. They're writing one of those reflections, and um, you could see them through. I share them out a lot on Twitter, um, and they talk about I, one of the questions I ask in their final play role prototype is, um, "What preconceived notions did you have, and how did the actual process, you know, compare?" Um, and kids quickly talk about how it was a lot harder than they thought. Maybe they didn't have the success in finishing. So I think by having the experience, they start to see. That yes, it's challenging. Um, it's more challenging than they thought. If they do decide to persist and continue to the industry, I think they have that context. And um, the business side is tough. I mean, I, yeah. you know, I've met, I know a lot of indie developers, and yeah, that is that is tough. Me so I don't too. know. Yeah. So um, you know, I guess, and and it's interesting too because I've seen a lot of um, you know people very successful working for AAA companies. And then decide to go indie and and kind of decide that's it seems like there's a huge passion there for independent developers that um, there's a good reason why you know people really want to work on their own games and and, and publish you know independently and stuff. Uh, but yeah, that's we we do talk about it, but I think it comes out again through their process and reflections. Yeah. And I think uh, going back to as you're saying like the start like. Your class is aimed at the middle school level, and like it's very, I think, important to understand this stuff as early as you can. I think one of the more fascinating things, like when I do my presentations, I usually say that they're like junior high age and up, and like with your class, like your students in the middle school area, like how has it been? I guess them like comprehending like these kinds of topics. You know, kids are kind of, um, in some ways, they're fearless, right? <laughs> so they dive right in, no problem. I think the interesting part comes when they have to um, have other people play their game, which is such an important part, and give feedback. And that, and I often have kids, I, we do feedback several different ways. We do it in a formal way where the kids, the, they'll play somebody's game and, and give written feedback. Mm -hmm. Then we also do something where... Um, one of the kids will play somebody else's game and the designer has to just stand behind them and watch and observe. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's very telling when they start to realize that somebody else perceives or approaches their game differently yeah. than they intended and they have to adjust because that's their audience. So these are great lessons for kids, I got to say. Mm -hmm. And I guess, like... Has it been easy, I guess, getting them interested in the topic? Like, when I talk about a lot of my stuff with game design, I can sometimes see, like, going over some of, like, even some of the junior high and high school levels' heads in terms of, okay, you need to think about your design like this, and you have to be very careful about what your role is. And, like, sometimes they, they're intent, sometimes they're just, like, looking around, like, is this guy going <laughs> to bring up, you know, Call of Duty at some point? Right, right. There's um, so first off, I mean, the, the beauty of it is that games are are very relevant to kids, so they're very excited about this opportunity to create their own game. So yes, they're they're excited. They approach it with with a level of enthusiasm that I don't see in a lot of other classes. Um, you know, I have kids come in during lunch, work on their projects after school without 
being assigned any homework, so to speak, because they're actually excited about what they're doing. Yeah. I also do have kids that I have to start as a teacher sometimes um, gauging my own expectations too, because certain parts like that game design document, some kids could get kind of frozen and 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 really struggle with writing that. So I have to either, you know, sort of draw them out a bit, help them sometimes realize when it is that we need to cut our losses and say, okay, let's move on. And, you know, I, I want them to have a good experience and design the game. And if they're just kind of kid that, you know, is going to be, again, paralyzed by writing this design document, I want to figure out a way to get yeah. them past that. So there's a lot of interesting things there. And that's always been like one of the more fascinating aspects. Like, I, I speak to a lot of indie developers as well, and one thing that I always get is that there is no such thing as like the quote-unquote formal process of making a game. And it's I think that's one of the more like interesting and challenging things to try and teach someone mm -hmm. is that you know it's that old saying you know the rules are there, but you can also completely break the rules as well if you want. And we've seen people succeed and fail on both sides of that. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. I um, hmm. I you know again when you say there's no like I, the one thing I do try to bring in. Mm -hmm. My my class is very open ended. Lots of opportunities for kids or different paths and such. Mm -hmm. But when they work on their final game, there's definitely a flow that I try to at least get yeah. them into the groove of where that's why I have them do those reflections. That's why I have them do the design document. That's why I have checkpoints where we do these beta tests. Um, they often have a point of frustration around some of the times when we choose to do testing because they always want to say they're not ready or they're not done. But I kind of insist that we do that, even if it's early, and then we talk about what an alpha test versus a beta test is and, and how they can get feedback even early in the process. But the point is, I need them to sort of at least have that some of that, that degree of structure. Um, and I like them to learn how it's done in the industry. Like I feel like the when they do their reflections, I also view that a little bit like a scrum session where they talk to their teammates and they, they talk about what they accomplished, they set their goals for the next week, those kind of things I try to have them do just to manage their time, which is what they wouldn't be good at without my at least guidance in that regard. Yeah, and I think that is a really great point. I think it's something that even a lot of indie developers and people in the industry tend to mess up on, is that yeah. while you can design you know, any game that you want, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, there is still, I think, some kind of standardization or like a formal process to actually getting that game out the door, getting something that people want to play. Right. And, oh, absolutely. And, and I, I, mean, I want to. I wanna, uh, I'm sorry. I just noticed yeah. something Sharky said, and I want to touch on and, and appreciate the comment. He says, especially when it comes to how you write a game design document, you can write it as a to-do list or more like mm -hmm. a feature set or tons of other ways. I think that's something that I need to also appreciate and um, and 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 learn from like I'm always learning about the process with my kids because again when I am too strict so to speak about like the design document has to cover all of this that's when those kids get get locked up if I give them some flexibility like like he's saying I, I, that's um, that's great yeah. so thank you for that yeah. And I and getting back to my point, I think that's really great that you're instilling these kids about kind of like again that there is this like formal structure that there is a difference between, you know, sitting at your room making a little prototype of a game versus making something that you want people to look at, you want people to appreciate. And like the play testing iteration, I think that is very key to get people to understand as early as possible. Right. So, um, I'm trying to think with regards to this. Like, now, one thing that you said earlier, that with your classes, they are not like of quote unquote, they're not like a formal programming class. You're focusing more on the design. So, you mentioned Game Maker earlier. What other mm -hmm. like programs or editors do you use or you have yeah. in your classroom? So, um, so it's interesting. Uh, Minecraft has actually become one of my favorite game design tools. Um, the the ability for kids to 
both A, come with some expertise in terms of using it as a building tool to begin with, but then when it comes to automation and me teaching kids how to automate through commands, command blocks, redstone, <laughs> um, in the education edition, non-player characters that can, can, can um, uh, you know, execute code. That part to me really kind of makes sense to the kids. They've created so, and, and and they could. One of those things you learn real quickly, like even Game Maker, which I love. Um, kids get up and running pretty quickly, creating something in Game Maker. And now for a quick shout out to our current Game Wisdom supporters and sponsors. Going forward, all Patreon supporters will get early access to our videos. And if you'd like to continue this discussion on game design, be sure to check out our Discord channel, link down below. If you're looking for more wisdom about game design, be sure to check out my latest offering of books, 20 Essential Games to Study, aimed for first-time developers and students looking for some inspiration for their upcoming games, and Game Design Deep Dive Platformers if you're interested in anything regarding 2D and 3D platforming design. They're both available in print, digital, and wherever books are being sold. What I, I used to have, when I first started my class, I wrote the curriculum and I knew that XNA Studio and Visual C Sharp was something that kids could use to create games for the Xbox, you know, 360, I think, at the time. Yeah. So I was all excited. We got an Xbox for my classroom written into the curriculum. I thought, wow, this is really great. And what I would do is I had a unit where I was teaching Visual C Sharp and coding for the Xbox. I figured this would be great. Well, it took us like two and a half weeks, let's say, to to write enough code that the kids could um, press a button on the controller and make the screen get more red or more green, <laughs> more yellow. And I quickly realized that for my kids, for the middle school kids, that was too steep of a learning curve to get them excited about game design. Um, so as I've gone, like tools like like Minecraft. Um, we started using Fortnite creative mode last year. That's been real successful. Um, my goal is to sort of bridge, especially now that I'm teaching high school, from like Fortnite creative to Unreal Engine so people, kids can see that progression. Um, also, Twine for text-based adventures has been tremendous. And, you know, I, I love nothing more than seeing a kid, you know, try a text-based adventure game and then decide to write one because in the days of... of graphics seeming to be so important when a kid realizes what's involved in writing a narrative based game <laughs> purely text that's really powerful yeah. um, so those are some of the things I also make code arcade is a great platform for learning basic uh, block based coding to code retro arcade games um, I want to get into Pico 8 a little bit with Lua and Python but but so some of that's you know going to be more coding, but again, I give kids a lot of that choice. So, um, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of 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 kids developing content for mine, you know, in Minecraft. Yeah. And, and I think uh, there's a real, and you made a really good point there about why these editors are so good, is the very fact that it removes or downplays the programming side of things. Like you said, with like learning like a visual uh, basic or visual C++ there, like you can spend weeks and you may have amount to move a blue square five feet over to a red square. Exactly. And that's your whole design. But right, with this right. stuff, you can within minutes start seeing, okay, I put a character here, I can have him jump, I can have him, you know, shoot or do whatever, yeah. and I can immediately get that information, and that is very important to starting to get the game design, game design side thing, because as we said earlier, game design in a way is different from coding and aesthetics, and if Definitely. you don't understand that, you're not really going, as you said, like you're not really going to be able to grasp what it is or what it takes to make these games. Yeah, the other thing that we like, or I like to focus on, is is product like a, you know, what they call like a, a um, what do they call it a low, uh, high, <laughs> low floor, high ceiling, something like that. <laughs> um, you know, the idea that with like Minecraft, mm -hmm. I've worked with kids like seven, eight years old to create mini games in Minecraft. Then as they evolve and start to learn a bit about the coding and things, it just explodes as to what's possible. So 
same thing with like Fortnite Creative with the triggers and things in that in in that environment. You know, you could be pretty advanced in what you create, or you can create something with just about no code at all, and yeah. and you know that gets kids started. So yeah, mm-hmm. I, I'm a fan of all that. Yeah. As a quick time check, I think we have about 30 minutes there, Bell, for this cast. So for the people watching, if you have any questions for Steve about games in the classroom, teaching, anything like that, definitely feel free to get them in. I do have a few questions that I definitely want to bring up with you and bring, again, tell me more about having these games in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, these are two things that kind of came up when we did a talk again. Like This was like two, three years ago with several developers about this. So the first thing, I want to talk about kind of the... If you ran into this like misconception that teachers or other or parents may have had, that when we're talking about having games in the classroom, that it's just having kids sit around and play Civilization or Call of Duty all day. And I just want to ask you, like, how has it been, I think convincing people that there is worth here yeah so i've had great success with that um people always ask that question Mm -hmm. and i think you know imagine that there would be resistance i you know i've heard the things like from parents like oh well they play minecraft all day at home why do they need to play (laughs) in school my answer is also often that's exactly why we need to bring it into school because it's relevant to kids the as long as i'm teaching to and and meeting the learning outcomes, you know, and and if this tool helps us do that, why not have it be something that's that meaningful to kids and that allows kids to bring their expertise into the room. Um, I've seen some really neat stuff happen where a student who was not, you know, a stellar student um, prior gets this opportunity to be the star when it comes to coding or something in Minecraft that nobody knew they had these skills, but this Mm -hmm. is something this kid has an aptitude for. There's a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, Also, I do think we have to be careful. Um, In education, people love to talk about the importance of uh, engagement, and Mm -hmm. I find engagement to be a, a scary term to use in terms of learning, because if I let my whole class play Minecraft for the entire class and just play, you would see a class that was completely engaged, you know? Um, But that wouldn't be intentional in terms of meeting the learning outcome. So, you know, and I've seen, you know, and then you have teachers who, uh, you know, I hate, (laughs) I hate the one where they say, oh yeah, we use Minecraft in class. We, when the kids are good and do all their work, (laughs) we let them play for 10 minutes at the end. And that's completely missing the boat too. I want to see these games be used as a meaningful, um, you know, a meaningful approach to learning, and with very much intention behind it, um, yeah. you know. So there's that, and 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 I think maybe that's been the success is that parents have seen that, um, and you know, and 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 they, I think they've started to understand that because we're doing game design. Excuse me, in my class, um, the amount of skills, like when I present about it at like a board meeting or something, and I can share all the different skills, all the different roles kids could play, the you know the potential for them to find their passion in an industry that is actually a very, you know, um, growing industry and such, you know that that helps a lot. But uh, but I think I think I think there's been a lot more people starting to become receptive to the idea than maybe a number of years ago. Yeah. I think what you said there is a really good point, something I like to hammer on here, that there is a difference between playing a video game for fun versus playing a game that you're studying or you're critically analyzing. And something that, like, even, like, a lot of people who watch my stuff don't, I think they still have trouble understanding this, that... If you want to sit and play Fortnite or Call of Duty or any game for 8 to 10 hours, you can do that. But that's not the same as being able to sit down and figure out, okay, what is this game trying to do? Does this design work? And it's something that, even like for myself, like I say this, like I may have been playing video games for all my life. I didn't really start to start studying them until probably like 2011, 2012, when I began doing these things with Game Wisdom. And getting that kind of understanding, getting it as early as you can, 
as you said, like even with getting them to start writing game design documents and iterating playtesting, it really, I think, puts them ahead of the curve, especially to a people who are trying to get in the industry before any of this stuff even began to happen. Right. Yeah, and um, let me do a quick shout-out. Uh, my buddy Lucas Gillespie... <laughs> oh, I, I lost you there for a second. Can you hear me still, Josh? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, it was weird, though. Like, the last part of what you said cut out, so I, I okay. was sort of talking. But uh, but uh, <laughs> Lucas Gillespie's uh, watching now, and um, when you asked before people that you should get on the show that are, uh, you know, have a lot of wisdom in terms of game-based learning. Um, he is the, the, the king um, in terms of, 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 of knowing, you know, about game-based learning as well as gamification and interesting ways to bring that into professional development in terms of um, teaching staff. So, uh, I have that really wisdom well. too. You can't really see it through the camera here. <laughs> What's that? Uh, his uh, <laughs> comment there about wisdom. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's just gray hair. That's funny. Look at mine. Mine's getting gray too. Sorry. <laughs> but no, Lucas is a uh, Lucas is a is a good 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 guy. Yeah. Glad to see you, Lucas. Thank you. And again, if anyone would like to come on, we are always looking for new guests, whether doing these things live or recorded. Now, uh, one thing that came up when I did this talk about four or five years ago that I wanted to ask you about is the idea of teaching to the common core. And this is something that if you're not in school, you don't look at education. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I'm reading these comments. It's not something that I think really comes up all that much outside of it. But obviously as a teacher, I'm sure you are well aware and well acquainted with it. So. If you wouldn't mind kind of like talking about and like what this means when it comes to game design to like kind of like my audience who is watching. So I'm going to shift here a little bit. Um, when it comes to Common Core, there are certain lessons, you know, I've written that I've had to align with Common Core and such. Um, I'm a much bigger fan of things like the ISTE standards, which apply more to what I teach, and that's the International Society for Technology and Education Standards. And they came out with an amazing set of, like, <laughs> I'm not a big fan of standards typically, but their standards are spot on in terms of the kinds of things we, I want or we want kids to learn, which, in de which deal with empowering students, students as creators, um, you know, creative uses of technology, um, really great stuff. My, those are the ones I go to first when I'm aligning my curriculum, and luckily, my curriculum seems to hit all of them, like right, you know, nail, you know, hit the nail on the head with those. Um, Common Core, I think when you're talking more about, you know, English language arts, you know, I would align some of my, like one of my assignments that I, uh, one of the projects my seventh graders do is they do something called uh, Fairy Tales Reimagined. And it's a lesson I wrote using Minecraft Education Edition where they recreate fairy tale, folktale, or fable and then make a digital story slash game um, in Minecraft. Now that hits a lot of the English language arts common core standards for sure. Um, and you know, people, you know, it's a it's a hot topic, you know, among educators too about common core. But uh, again, I I lean much more towards the more practical standards that talk about kids as you know as creators and designers and all that. And that's because it also ties more closely to my content area. Great. I'm trying to think again. I'm trying to keep us like on time while you run too late for your next meeting. Um, I think I have one more like kind of like overall game design question for you, and then I do want to spend a few minutes talking about things from the esports side of things. And again, yeah. this could e this is easily going to be like another cast worth of conversation. So. Uh, if you are free in the future, I would definitely love to have you back on for more talks about sure. this. But when it comes to, like, again, you mentioned games like Fortnite, Minecraft, Mario Maker, games that have editors to them. Have there been, like, any discussions or having games that are kind of, I don't know if I want to use the term, like, educational, but having more of a learning focus. Like, I'll give you a few examples. Games like Factorio, Kerbal oh, yeah. Space Program. I'm sure you've heard of the games by Zachtronics by now, his, like, programming-based challenges. 
No, I should take a look. Yeah. But, like, those kinds of games that they're not exactly, like, like, it, they don't really allow for, like, editors, like the, like the games uh, we mentioned, but more like that kind of learning or critical skills standpoint. Absolutely. And even for my students, like, when I want them to start, you know, learning, let's say, skills around coding, I certainly might point to coding-oriented games. You know, there's, like, Code Combat and all sorts of others. Um, you know, and, and there, let's see what Lucas say here. He does interactive fiction writing. With, yes. And, oh, somebody, I'm sorry, somebody else. That's funny. <laughs> they're they're okay. conversing. Um, but the, so there are some great games for learning, and there are some really poorly executed games for learning. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned some good ones. Factorio is a phenomenal game. Mm -hmm. um, if you find a way to bring that into your curriculum, absolutely. Kerbal Space Program, I know a lot of teachers use for science yes. curriculum, and I think that's great. Um, you know, now that we're getting more into, like, VR and stuff, I think a lot of the simulation-type stuff that we can do that's game-oriented can help us, you know, teach, you know, certain skills in an, in an, in an engaging, um, you know, way. So all of that I'm all for. I mean, I love games and learning. The reason I bring up more, like, those tools with editors is because I'm teaching yes. game design. But remember, my kids also write um, game reviews, and when I have them look at games for learning, I have them do that with a very critical lens, too, because um, we've, uh, as educators interested in game-based learning, one thing we've always cringed at and been very um, aware of is the, you know, what we used to or maybe still call chocolate-covered broccoli where you have a game that is really just like yes. a drill and kill type situation that <laughs> is really just might as well be a quiz that they <laughs> put in a wrapper of a game and call it a game. I, I mean, I've seen such horrible examples. So um, I, I am more like I like that you bring up Kerbal and Factorio because those are commercial games that happen to have great educational value. Lucas, who's also, you know, who we mentioned on here is um, he wrote an entire curriculum called Wow in Schools for World of Warcraft nice. in Schools, completely aligned with the language art standards. I mean, the manual, which he offers for free, the, the teacher's guide, is, I mean, it's, you know, the size of an encyclopedia. Mm -hmm. um, and that's using, you know, a commercial game, but tying it to those standards, you know, so making that work and just beautifully. So... You know, you know. I'm glad Lucas is out there because he's he's with me with all this stuff about um, you know, good, you know, kids, kids smell a learning game from a mile away, <laughs> you know, um, but a game that's that holds its weight, and that's one of the things I ask them when they evaluate the games for learning. I'm like, would this, would you be, will, would you go home and play this game if you weren't doing it for school? That's yes. one question I have. The other question I have is. You know, at the same time, in all fairness, would you rather, you know, play this game or learn from a textbook? You know, because th there's there are gray areas there too, where some games, yeah, I'd rather play that game than learn from a textbook, but I'm certainly not gonna go home and play that game when Fortnite's staring me down. You know? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, I had Math Blaster, the whole learning ah. company catalog. I had that back in the day. <laughs> That's so funny. Math Blaster is one I use as an example all the time. And you know, I, I have to say, in a in in a, in a way, I'm conflicted sometimes too because Math Blaster is the the perfect example of a of a drill and kill game mm -hmm. that you know does that. Now, however, I would probably rather sit there and blast these things by by solving math problems than I would doing a worksheet, but not by a whole lot, you know. Um, but it is interesting that that brings us back to that question of engagement. But uh, but I do agree. I would not go home and be like, I can't wait to beat level 17 of <laughs> math. Yes. And I gotta say, as somebody who's been doing a lot in terms of bringing video games and, like, trying to get into the academia space, I am loving this cast right now. I hate for us to wrap this up in a few minutes, but... It's, again, such a fascinating topic, and it's one that we really don't have, I think, as many conversations about it as we should. Well, you know, and let me say, I love that you're bringing it on to this cast, because you're right, it, it poses, um, you know, a different audience to the conversation. Um, 
often we talk, you know, in an echo chamber, and 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 this is neat to be able to to talk to your audience. So I appreciate that. Yeah. So with that, I do definitely want to spend a few minutes talking more about things from the esports side yeah. of things. And again, like there is so much more we could have a discussion about. Like my audience, they love it when we go three, four hours. Ah, for wow. <laughs> oh yeah, like this is your first time. Like you are the novice here, but oh yeah, they love it. They they have their running. Oh, my voice starts to go. They have the running count for when my voice starts to die from all the talking that I do here. Well, well, I'll, I'll try to. Yeah, w w you'll warm me up. I'll, I'll get ready for a marathon <laughs> session another time. Yeah. That sounds but talking about esports again, like esports is its own unique field these days, and totally. it is separate from design. So some of these questions, I think that we've already asked, we can certainly apply them here. So yeah. to begin with. I guess, uh, first of all, to begin with, what has been, like, your background, or, like, what do you, or do you do anything with esports yeah. in the schools? Absolutely. So, um, a number of years ago, probably about three years ago, um, you know, you started hearing these, uh, I had always been interested in esports and competitive gaming, but all of a sudden, we started getting these articles come across that were like, you know, this school give, is giving scholarships for players yeah. to play video games. <laughs> Um, that was a, an awesome point in in the in esports in that it made it make so much easier to present the argument to like administration. So I started seeing that, and then you had the when you look at the statistics about the the viewership um, of things like right now actually the League of Legends uh, World Championships going on. The last few years it's done amazing things. Like three year or four years ago, it exceeded viewership for. Uh, the, the viewership yeah. exceeded that of the um, NBA Finals and the clinching game of the World Series. Last year, or it might have even been 2018, it exceeded the viewership of the Super Bowl. So, you know, it's very interesting. You know, once you start to see it from a monetary standpoint, people can't help but listen. So we have an explosion going on right now with esports, and I'm super excited about it. Um, we started an esports EDU Twitter chat and Discord community. Nice. Um, I tweet that link out a lot. I'll share it with you. The Discord has over 800 members that are all excited about esports and education. Um, I started a number of years ago a game club in my school. Um, we moved to this what they call a pay to play um, program for after school activities because the budgets all got cut for after school stuff. So the only way to have an after school program was if kids you know, essentially supported it uh, by paying to register. So at the time, I figured, let me do it as a game club. But in the description, I, I wrote that there will be opportunities to compete, you know, as we're moving towards competitive gaming as well. Um, so my game club started as a somewhat casual situation, but we did a lot of, like, we do in-house tournaments and things like that. And then um, another person you need to get on the cast, Chris Aviles, um, he, you know, we present together a lot. It's interesting because we always talk about how different our program started, but we both had good success. He came at it from this. I'm, you know, I'm a, you know, a, a rugby player. You know, I'm, I was a, you know, a varsity coach for several sports for all these years. I'm coming at it directly, completely at that esports competitive, like varsity level approach, which I respect a hundred percent. In fact, on our high school level, that's how we started last year. So I totally get that. Um, but what was interesting is I wanted this competition to come out of it, and I quickly realized, ooh, this casual thing I started is great as an affinity space for kids to hang out and stuff, which I wouldn't trade for anything. But it wasn't really morphing so quickly into this you know, true competition practice thing. And then when Chris called me and said, hey, I'm looking to um, – set up a Rocket League match against another middle school. Can you put a team together? Uh, I said to my students, I was like, hey, you know, we have another school that wants to play us in Rocket League. Does anybody play Rocket League? And all of a sudden, kids come out of the woodwork um, and are like, yeah, I play Rocket League. Or they're like, wait, we can play against another school. <laughs> and they got super excited. So that really kick-started our middle school esports program and if you just watch what's going on right now it is so incredible to watch it's it's growing 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 i get emails every day chris gets emails in fact we're actually writing a book right now with um jesse labinsky and christine lyon bailey 
about esports, um, and a lot of it's kind of a, our stories and how to get started, and a lot of um, conversations with a lot of great people in the field. Throw another name out that Lucas will be happy to hear. Um, um, uh, Doc Haskell, Chris Haskell, who will be uh, in our book and stuff like that. Uh, but it's just you know it, you know it, it's like um, I was even just at a, a professional conference, the Future of Educational Technology Conference (FETC), and you know I go to these conferences and I present about esports and other things. This one, it felt like 30% of the conference was about esports. So it's like we we've been talking about it lately as a coming out party for esports and education. Um, so it's just you know I couldn't be more thrilled. Um, you know it's like it, it's like when you've been waiting around your whole life for something and it yeah. and it finally happens. You know, it, it, it sounds fascinating. And again, like for myself and for I think a lot of the people watching, like when we were growing up. You know, there was no such thing about this in schools. You know, we heard about StarCraft and, yeah. like, those kinds of games. But, again, just like with our previous point about game design, you know, that was never going to be in a school setting, let alone a public school. Right. And yeah. it's that same thing. We're starting to see that push into it. And I think, as you said a few minutes ago, with people starting to realize not only is this, you know, big time, like, you know, we're getting a lot of press, but... There is some serious money being thrown yeah, at this, and you know what? That I mean, we follow the money, right? And 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 it's only smart. Like esports, the other thing, if we're talking education, I mean, the competitive gamer is only a small part of the esports ecosystem. Um, you know, we get into things like shoutcasting or announcing the games. Um, so we're streaming. We're giving kids opportunities around video editing and marketing and every aspect you know kids designing the logo and the um you know and our jerseys and things like that so the the possibilities around esports when we start to think like anybody who wants and that's kind of like what i was saying with game design about it doesn't have to be the programmer it can be so many other roles esports follows that same model like beautifully yeah so i guess uh, going back to our previous point i just wanted to ask you like as you said, like, or we've been saying, like, it's been getting a lot more recognition. Was there any, like, initial pushback similar uh, to trying to get, you know, video game, game design in the classroom, but getting esports in there? Um, if you, oh gosh, yeah, if you go onto our Discord, you'll see a lot of people talking about a lot of challenges they've had. Chris is a great example because he approached his board, he knew what he wanted to get started, and he got a lot of um, pushback uh, based basically in his case with his middle school it was couldn't play Overwatch violent. They even wouldn't let them play League of Legends because of the violent themes and the the characters, yeah. things like that. So he finally got them to accept Rocket League and now he's pushed forward. I was my situation was a little different. I because of that pay to play situation and billing it initially as a game club my principal realized, hey, this is something, you know, first of all, with the pay to play club, either kids sign up and it runs or they don't. And and the idea of it, she understood was like, this will be good, you know, for the that kid that doesn't have that maybe homeschool connection. And, and Chris uses that term all the time. And, you know, you're giving a space for these kids. Um, the high school, I was also very lucky because I met with the principal and, and and I was not sure how receptive he would be, and he immediately kind of just said yes. So different people have very different stories, but there's been a lot. Now, though, we're in this very interesting time. I'm getting calls. Like, actually, the call I said I have next is with some folks that are, like, administrative people at the um, LAUSD, so Los Angeles Unified School District, that are talking about starting esports and want some feedback and stuff. So now... A lot of times it's the superintendent or the administrator that's saying, hey, we need to have this. So we've turned a huge corner there. Yeah. And what you just said about, like, kind of like the T and even arguably like M rated games, like, I think this is another thing that kind of goes back to our previous point that a lot of people will assume that, you know, we're just playing like violent games in school or we're just doing that. And. I think it has gone better. Like we are, like as you said, like with Fortnite, with uh, the Minecraft, and so on. That we're seeing games that 
can be enjoyed by a very wide age range. So, yeah, I'll, I'll bring a few things here. So, um, Minecraft has a uh, keep your eye out starting February 1st, and I hope um, Lucas is paying attention to this one. <laughs> uh, competitive Minecraft is, is making a huge really? push, um, and we're doing a middle school league hmm. that starts very soon. Um, it's a capture the flag or capture the wall okay. map, but it plays just like, you know just like all the other games, but it's in Minecraft, so that, you know, is a little easier, um, more palatable for administrators and things. But uh, we have to really look at that question about selection of games, too. The popular games still are, you know, Fortnite, Overwatch, Rainbow Siege, League of Legends. It's still, a, a, a fa even Rocket League, it's still a fairly male-dominated mm -hmm. Um, type set of games, so we're still struggling with the inclusive environment. And I'll throw out another name, but Jay Collins is doing. Um, uh, it won't be Education Edition, Lucas. It'll be uh, uh, Java 1.8. But I'm sure you get enough copies of that going. Um, but the but uh, but Jay Jay Collins um, has been tremendous in in recognizing what it takes to be inclusive and um, they have a they teach at a an all girls school and have the first all girls esports nice. club and they created something called the mischief league which is a variety of games to try to bring more inclusive more inclusivity so those are, those are all important points that we're still trying to tackle um, the good news is I think as a community the esports and education community is really striving to do things right and do right by students and do what's best for kids but we do still have a long way to go in yeah. terms of figuring that one out yeah and i guess very quickly like as you've been saying over this cast like it's very important to get these lessons in you know as early as you can not just in terms of the game design point of view but again about the community the inclusivity and I keep bringing this point up that we didn't have any of this growing right. up. We basically just let it go to the wolves in the Wild West, and so, yeah. it, it still is, arguably, in a lot of cases. Still, you know, and a lot of people still look at it as the Wild West. Yeah. I think we're coming a little bit out of that, but, I mean, wow. It's like when you think of the organizations that are all vying for, a, like, sort of a piece of the pie, so to speak, and trying to figure it all out, um, like – like the high school level, there are a number of organizations like NACEF or the North American Scholastic Esports Federation that are doing a great job of both providing free um, and great resources, including even coaching and things. Then you get down to the middle school, and like Chris and I, Chris Aviles and I, you know, we're trying to, you know, create something out of almost nothing because so far middle school is still not. I mean, we're getting there, but definitely the high schools that are really trying to make it. Um, you know, more established. So, you know, we have a long way to go, but but the but the the excitement around it right now, it's just um, it's tremendous, and it's not going anywhere. That's for sure. Yeah. And I hate to end this cast because I am, like I said, I'm really enjoying this one. But we are right at four fifteen. So, uh, like I said, if you're free in the future, I'm more than happy to have you back on because there's still so much to discuss. Yeah, absolutely, so, Josh. I'd love to. So, I think with that said, final question. Anything that you want to end this cast on? Like, like if you want to speak to my audience about kind of games in the classroom or game design, I'm going to let you have the yeah. mic here. So, here you go. Um, one of the things I love to do more than anything is to bring uh, professionals and game developers into um, my classroom to talk to kids. So, I think that's a great way that, that um, a lot of your audience can contribute is people that are out there. You know, Sharky, who talked a lot about the challenges and things, it'd be great to have somebody like them talk about to, to my students, you know, about, hey, you know, I love what I do, but, you know, here's reality. And here's, oh, yes. you know, talking about a design document, talking about all those <laughs> things. Um, so, yeah, that that's an open invitation to much of your community is come into people's classroom and share their, their expertise. Okay. And do you have any social media, Twitter, groups, whatever, that you would like to plug and the cast on? Yeah. So, well, my Twitter, I mean, I'd love for people to follow me, and, and uh, I share a lot of what I'm doing, especially in the classroom, is at Mr. like MR underscore Isaacs, I-S-A-A-C-S. Um, 
esports edu is both a hashtag and that's our discord community um like i said i could send or share a a link um to the the invite link to the mm -hmm. esports edu community um games for ed is another hashtag mm -hmm. that um talks a lot to game based learning and uh and make sure you follow lucas gillespie <laughs> Great. And yeah, I'm always up for like doing presentations either live or, uh, or I'm sorry, in person or through Skype to talk about game design and my thoughts as well. So we are definitely out there. Okay, but, that's great. But yeah, like again, I, I'm resisting the urge to keep you on for another hour. So uh, we're going to end things here for this cast. For your audience watching, you can follow me on Twitter at GW Bicer. There's a link to my Discord and Patreon link down below. Um, if you want my hang on call for like 30 seconds after we're done, I just have one thing to go over with you. And sure. if you're always looking for, or if you're looking uh, to come on for this cast, we're always looking for new guests, whether for live or recorded talks about game design, game dev, or any role in the industry as well. Please don't hesitate to get in touch. But yeah, I'm rushing through this because I don't want to keep Steve late for his next talk. But thank you again for tuning in whether you're watching this live or recorded. And come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where he's in the art and science of games. Until our next chat, have a great rest of your day. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoy things, be sure to do all the liking and subscribing that the kids are doing these days. Check out our Discord channel link down below where we hang out and chat game design and come back later tonight for our regular streamings. But that's it, and tune in for more great content here and on Game Wisdom, where we examine the art and science of games.